talking today about the difference between a good idea and a God idea. The difference between a good idea and a God idea. 2 Samuel is where we are, starting in verse 1, chapter 7. It's a long passage, but we're going to read through it. Verse 1 says, Now when the king, that's being David, lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, and do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Verse 4. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling in all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel Did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, And have cut off all your enemies before you, and I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men. With the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Father in heaven, we we thank you for this passage that you give us. Lord, we see this, this, this passage where your servant David had an idea, something he wanted to do, Lord, and, and, and you were not for that, at least not in his way, in, in his idea of doing it, Father. So, Lord, show us today how, how a good idea, Father, is, is, is not always a God idea. And Lord, and show us how how we can follow what your idea is, Lord, as you lead us through your spirit, as you lead us uh, in that way, Father. I pray that my words are yours today, that you speak through me with your spirit, that your spirit fills this place, and we all hear it, and we listen to it, and it affects our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to show you today three contrasts, if you will, about a good idea a good idea for the Lord that you might have versus a God idea. A good idea versus a God idea. Number one, a good idea is not always identical to a God idea. A good idea is not always identical to a God idea. You might have a great plan, a great idea for, for, for serving the Lord or for a ministry or, or for how God's working in your life or something you want to do, and it might not be sinful, it might be good, and it, good might come out of it, but if it's not something that God is really behind, it's not always the same thing. They're not identical. Just because you want to do something in the name of the Lord doesn't mean God really is behind it. All right? Look at verse 1. 
Now, when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had gave him rest from all his surrounding enemies, David finally had rest. He was finally the king. He had rest from King Saul trying to murder him. He had rest from his enemies. And now he had time to think about what's next. When he came home last night, I uh, just had the girls with me. John, David, and Jackson went up yesterday just for the day with, with Emily for her, her father's birthday. And I haven't seen John, David in three or four days. And I have had rest from <laughs> not my enemies. but and, I, and I've had time to think and process uh, with just the two girls, right? Because Annabeth doesn't speak much at all. Abigail is like me. But she, I, we can still have time to think, right? And, and this is what David, he, he, the fighting was over. He had rest, and so he had time to think as a king, what, what should we do? What, what should I do now? How, how can I pay back to my, to my God who loves me? How, how can I bless God? And, 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 and he came up with this idea that seemed like a good idea. Verse 2 the king said to Nathan, the prophet who God spoke through, he said, Hey, I, I dwell in a house of cedar, but God, the glory of God in the, tab in the tabernacle, in the ark, uh, it's in a tent. That's not right. That shouldn't be. Now, no doubt part of his desire to build God a house, a temple or so, was influenced by all of the false gods that he saw that had temples and shrines. It's the same now. You can go to Japan and different areas where they, they have false gods that they worship. They have shrines and temples where these gods supposedly dwell, but we know they don't exist there. In some cases, it's demonic. And he's thinking, all these false gods have places where they dwell, and, and the real God is in a tent. The real glory of God where he resides with us is in a tent. He deserves better. And we'd all say, yeah, amen, right? We, we would agree. Yeah, he does. And then, to make it worse, I say, not really worse, but to underscore his idea, because he's the king, Nathan says, verse 3, right on, yeah. He says, yeah, hey, follow your heart, David. <laughs> go do all this in your heart. It's almost like what we're here today. Hey, if your heart's leading you to do it, go do it. The Lord's with you. Do it. Nathan was God's prophet. The idea seemed good to Nathan. So he advised him and blessed it. Now, David wasn't a prophet. He was just a king. But Nathan said, yeah, that, that sounds reasonable. Go do it. Follow your heart. Verse 4. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. See, God didn't wait along. He didn't wait around for this one. That same night, before any plans could be drawn, any workers could be drafted, any... Any, uh, uh, you know, this isn't David building the house now. This would have been all the Israelites building this, right? Uh, before anything could happen, Nathan, the Lord, the Lord came to Nathan that night, verse 5. He says, Go and tell my servant David this. Thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? Verse 6. I've not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt. I've been moving around in a, twint, a, a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved, with all the people of Israel, did I, did, did I ever say, why have you not built me a house? <laughs> of all the things I've said, have I ever said, where's my house? No. In all the travelings that the Israelites did, God gave many, many commands. You can go and read them. <laughs> many, many commands but not once did he tell them, hey, Moses, hey, Joseph, Joshua, build me a house. Right? Now, if he wanted it done, believe me, he would have commanded it, amen? He would have said it, but he hadn't yet. And I think this seems to be a common theme, uh, even today with Christians, with believers. Uh, one temptation I think we have is to always want to be doing something new for the kingdom of God. Even in churches, like, let's, let's find, what, what can we do? And, and I, I'm constantly racking my brain thinking about, hey, what can we do, right? How can we reach more people? Things like this. And, and, then, and some people, sometimes we want to hear uh, maybe even like a new word from the Lord. Like, you know, I, I just want the Lord to speak something new in my life. You know, I just want him to, to tell me what I need to do with my life. And give me a new word, a, a new vision. Let me do something new in my life. But, but see, God's already spoken. It's in the Bible. 
So sometimes we're waiting around for a new word when we have his, not old, but his current word. So maybe sometimes we should try to make sure we can do what God's called us to do first, amen, before anything new, and that's a whole different sermon. But God gave Israelites a lot to worry about, a lot to worry about. Building a house was not one of them. He gave them a lot of commands to obey. Building a house was not one of them. Now, there's nothing sinful in building him a house, nothing wrong with it, but he didn't command it. So he didn't want them wasting time doing something he wasn't commanding when they commanded them to do other things. Not all good ideas are God ideas. And just because it works or is good, or just because Christians are doing it, doesn't necessarily mean that God is behind it. There might be, quote-unquote, successful ministries, successful uh, leaders and pastors, successful churches, but it does not mean God is behind it. He could, and he might be, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily the same thing. We want to be doing good ideas that are God's ideas. Amen? That's where the blessing is. And part of being a believer is asking wisdom and guidance to find that out. You'll never hear me. And I, and I, and I don't ever say, I don't like saying never, he'll say never, but this is something I truly believe in. You'll never hear me stand up here and say, God has told me that as a church we're going to do X, Y, Z. You'll never hear me say that. You'll never hear me say, it is God's will to X, Y, and Z. Unless it's revealed in God's Word. If it's not God's Word and I say it, then something's wrong with my mind. Because we don't quite ever know God's special will that He tells us through the Holy Spirit, not in Word, but through the Spirit. We don't actually know the exact things until they come about. We might have an idea. We, hey, I think God is leading this way. We're going to pray through it. We're going to take a step in faith. But no one knows for sure those things. And if they do, they don't. We don't know what David might have said. Hey, this is God's will to build a house. God said, nope, not for you, it's not. Good ideas are never God's. They're not always the same thing. And they're not identical as God's ideas. Number two, a good idea is never better than a God idea. A good idea is never better than a God idea. And that should be somewhat, uh, that should make sense to us, right? Look at verse 8. So he tells Nathan, this is what you're going to tell David. I took you from the pasture, from the people following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. God tells Nathan, Nathan, go remind David who he is. <laughs> He's a shepherd, you know. Remind him where he came from. Sometimes I think we forgot where we come from, amen? My grandmother used to say that, that someone has gotten too big for their britches. We know people like that. Sometimes that people is us. Right? He says, go, go remind David where he came from. He was a shepherd. He made a shepherd a prince. A shepherd w was despised. Look down upon occupation. You were constantly dirty. You constantly smelled like sheep. If you're a young man looking to get married, you wouldn't put you're a shepherd on your profile or tell your date that. You would say you do something in agriculture, probably. It was a look down upon profession. Sheep are dumb. Go YouTube sheep, and you'll see what I mean if you've never been around them. They can't take care of themselves. You have to shear them or they'll die. You have to lead them or they'll die. They have no defense mechanism other than the fact that they stink. They have to have a shepherd, which is why God calls us, what? Sheep. That should tell us a lot, right? And he gives us shepherds, and Jesus is the ultimate shepherd. So, God says, remind David where he came from. You were a shepherd now you're a prince. Now, I was watching a little bit of the inauguration. I saw about 10 minutes of it, of King Charles. I just watched it because he has my name. I'm joking. Just on the TV, I watched a few minutes of it. 
I can only take about five minutes of it. Anyway, but the pageantry, the pomp, the circumstance was just so overblown. I just can't get over it, right? But here is a prince, even though he's you know, in his 60s or 70s, becoming a king, finally. Now, this huge celebration. How much money was spent on this? I can't even imagine. Millions, millions of dollars, right? This is what happened to David. There's no video footage of it, but they had an inauguration. They had a celebration. They took this shepherd boy and made him a king, and everybody loved David, and you would have too. Everybody loved him. He was a man after God's own heart, after all. God said so himself. But God's quick to remind him that he, God, made David into this. <laughs> he made David into this. David probably had a lot of maybe career aspirations, but I guarantee you being king was not one because when he was young, there was no such thing as a king. There were judges. He probably never saw himself in this position, but now he's here and he says, Nathan, remind him where I took him because David being king was a God idea, which is always better than what idea we have. And so then he reminds David, furthermore, and because you're king, let me tell you how you've been blessed and how I'm going to bless you. Building a house is not how you're going to do it. He says in verse 9, I've been with you wherever you went. And have cut off all your enemies before you. So I made you a king. I've been with you. Defeat your enemies. And also I will, I haven't done it yet, but I will make you a great name like the name of the great ones on the earth. And God did it because the name David is one of the most famous people ever. Even if you're not a Christian, you've probably heard of King David. So he tells them this. He says, I've taken you and made you who you are now, but my plan with you is not over. It's not complete. And I think that's very important for all of us who are here today. If you're alive today, God's plan for you is not over. It's not complete. He's still working. Now, none of us, I promise you, will be called to be king of Israel. (laughs) That's not our plan, God's plan for our life. But he has one. He has a perfect plan, a perfect idea for your life. And just like David at this point in his life, he's not finished with you, he's not finished with me. We think we we, we might think that's the case, but he's not. And then God then says this, he says, because I'm blessing you, David, and that's God, that's my plan for you, you're going to then bless, or I'm going to bless you, this will also engender the blessing of all of Israel, is because I'm blessing you, all of Israel will be blessed. If God blessed some person like that, that everyone around them would be blessed, I'd want to hang out with that person, wouldn't you? <laughs> Find someone like that in your life. Verse 10 says, I'll, I'll give a place for my people, I will plant them. They're not going to be nomads anymore. They'll be planted. They're not going to be disturbed anymore. No one will, will create violence, and I'll give you rest from the enemies. See, a, a good idea of building God a house, it would, it would bless God and give God glory, but that's it. A God idea of blessing David would bless the entire nation of Israel. So this good idea sounded great, but God says, no, 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 I, have, I don't want you wasting your time sawing lumber and hammering nails for me. That's not what we're going to do. We, I'm going to use you to bless all of Israel. How powerful are true God ideas? You know, you can try to chart out your future, <laughs> but if God isn't in it, it won't be as good as it could be. You know, about five years ago, I had my whole life pretty much planned out. I had my three stepchildren every two, three years. Steps, you know what I mean? They're my children, but you know what I mean, steps. <laughs> And then John David came along. And we weren't prepared for it then, and we were not prepared for it now. (laughs) Still catching up. Still catching up. And I spent three days, when we found out, reimagining the rest of my life. 
And now I can't imagine life without that little rascal. Right? My, my daughters probably can. <laughs> can't imagine it. But God's in it. It's a God idea. Amen? And God's ideas are always better than our good ideas. It's never better than a God idea. Number three. A good idea is often changed to a God idea. This is the great thing about God's working in your life. He didn't just maybe reject our good ideas. He improves them. Amen? He takes them. He changes them. He, he makes them even better than we could ever think of. Look at, he says, moreover, in the second half of verse 11, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. What? Hey, you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to make you a house. Now, he's speaking metaphorically. He's speaking about his family lineage, but he's using that word house as that, as that idea, a play on words. Because he already had a house he was living in. I'm going to make you a house. What? God does something funny with David's idea. He adopts it. He hacks it. <laughs> he hijacks it. He, he changes it. He, he twists it. He says, oh, there's going to be a house that is built, but it'll be your house, David. Imagine thinking, what? God took David's good idea, he hacked into it, and he gave it an idea that was even better for David. Not only better for David, better for all of Israel. Not even better for all of Israel, for all of mankind, as we're going to see in a minute. Verse 12, he says this, when your days are fulfilled, when you're old and dying... You lie down with your fathers. I'll raise up your offspring after you, and who shall from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He's talking about Solomon. He'll build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne. He says, your son will build me a house. I'll have one. You're not doing it, though. But your son will. And I'll be like his father. He'll be like my son. Verse 15, but my love will never depart from him as I took it from Saul. And that would probably be the worry, because Saul was the king and God left him, whom I put away before you. He said, you'll have a house, but you also have a lineage. King Saul was the king, and then his lineage was over. The first king was a failed, failed system, not on God's part, but on Saul's part. He says, but David, this, the same is not going to be true with your family. Your family is going to have a lineage. It's going to be a lineage more than you could ever imagine. What started out as a good idea to build God a house. Hey, let's go build God a house. God hijacks it and makes it an eternal reality that benefits not only David, but all of mankind. See, through the lineage of Jesus, I mean, I mean through the lineage, of, the lineage of David came Jesus Christ, the son of David. That's what that means. Now, God already had this planned out. But he reveals it right here to David. He says, David, l l let, me, let me tell you, this is my covenant with you, is what he's doing. Let, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to have a, a family on this throne, but it's going to be eternal. And, and Jesus is going to come from you. And Jesus is going to live a life that we couldn't live. He's going to die the death that, that only a sinner should have. And when God sent Jesus Christ to this earth, he died on the cross for all the sins of us. He took God's wrath to make a way where there wasn't a way so that those who placed their faith in Jesus would be saved. And he says, it's going to be eternal. It's going to come through this. And he just gives David a little piece of this, right? He doesn't explain it all. He gives him a piece of that truth. We know it. But he says, this is coming. You're your house will never end. That's a God idea, amen? The ultimate God idea of all God ideas. Jesus Christ coming into the world. And God used David's little small way of thinking about building God a house to say, hey, it's much bigger than you could ever think. Here's what's going to happen. And then as a pastor, this is one of my favorite verses, verse 17 as we close. It says this. And in accordance with these words, in accordance with this vision, Nathan spoke to David. 
Can you imagine Nathan going to, going to bed and God speaks to him and says, you need to go tell the king his idea is not going to happen. Nathan walks into his room and says, uh, King David, about that house, well, we don't have enough workers. We don't have enough materials. Why not? Uh, God says you're not building that. <laughs> See, we know later in the Old Testament when a prophet told a king God says not to do it, they just killed the prophet. The evil kings. So he probably was a little worried. But what did Nathan do? He didn't change God's word. He didn't modernize it. He didn't tweak it. He told David what God had said. Amen. He told him. Good ideas often change to a God idea. God is in the business of not only taking our sins, our mistakes, and making them work for His glory and our good, Romans 8, 28. What does He also do? He takes our good ideas, and He makes them even better. Amen. Makes them even better. You might be thinking, well, Pastor, how do I know if my idea is good or good or a God one? How do I know? Well, if it's square, it squares with, with Scripture, you know it's a God idea. If you wanted to start a church, I would say, yeah, the book tells you how to do it right there. Pastors, elders, deacons, go to, go to work, <laughs> right? But things that aren't specifically spilled out. How do I know? Well, if you're a believer in Jesus, you have this thing called the Holy Spirit. Working in you, leading you, God himself, matching up with Scripture. Pray about it. Seek his face. God will reveal to you his ideas. He will, as you're praying through it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. Those in here today, probably many in here who have tough decisions to make in their lives or worries. They don't know what to do and they worry about it and they, and they talk to people, which is fine, they good, and they get good godly counsel. They don't know what to do. But Lord, just like when I was driving on the interstate and I knew I probably should listen, when it comes to following your word, most of us know what we're supposed to do. We just don't want to do it. So we look for confirmation. Father, lead the, the, those that are in here today. When they have decisions, when they have things they want to accomplish, lead them and make sure they're doing a God idea, not a good idea. Because we want your blessing to be behind everybody's decisions in this church. Because Lord, as our church is following a God idea, not only will it bless us, it will bless all of Monk's Corner. It will bless all of Berkeley County if God's people are doing your work. Lord, if there's one here today that's never placed their faith in you, that today they would do so. And that's the best God idea they could ever have. You would save them today. And Lord, for those of us as we leave here today, help us know your will and follow it and lead us in the way. Lord, we love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us?